Well, I invite you uh, for the very first time at Rock Valley Bible Church for the next year or so, maybe a little bit longer than that, I invite you to open your Bibles to the book of Revelation. And that we're going to begin this morning an exposition of this great book of the Bible. Um, it's the, the last book of the Bible, and it really deals with the end of the world. It deals with everything that leads up to the end of the world, and it's really a, a fitting way to end the Bible. The Bible begins in Genesis chapter 1 with uh, the creation of the world and a creation of a perfect garden. Adam and Eve in perfect fellowship with God, but because of their sin, the world's been ruined. And our contribution to that world is just contributing more and more to the ruin of the world. <clears throat> but this book of Revelation really tells the story of how the world will be fixed and really put back together. When, um, when the sin that's ruined the world is finally judged and, and all the rebellion against the Lord is finally conquered. So that by the end of the book, we have God's people dwelling not in a perfect garden, but in a glorious, perfect city, the, the New Jerusalem. Now, to get to the New Jerusalem, we're, um, we're going we're to evolve some things that take place in order to get there. But the Re book of the Revelation really tells that story and I just say this morning, I'm excited to start to tell that story to you all. We would see Jesus Christ finally establishing His kingdom in all of its fullness. Now, the big application of the book of Revelation comes at the very end. So if you want to turn back there, you, you can. It's the very last chapter of the book, the penultimate verse of that chapter. We read this. He who testifies to these things says, Surely I am coming soon. That is Jesus. Amen, says John. Come, Lord Jesus. And this simple prayer, Come, Lord Jesus, is the prayer that, that I hope all of you pray by the time we get to the end of the book. That when you, we hear the events that will take place before the end, and um, when you think about them, you will come to long for that time when Jesus comes back and establishes His kingdom. And it's my prayer that by the end of Revelation, you're going to be praying, come Lord Jesus, that the end of the world won't scare you, but that the end of the world will be something that you, you long for. That, that you're saying, yes, I want, I want, oh Lord Jesus, you to come and establish your kingdom. That the things of this world are not so dear to you that you say, no, I want the things here. I love what's here now. Rather, it's going to become Lord Jesus and establish your kingdom. Such a prayer is an expression, really, of, of your longing and your desire to see the kingdom of God come. Paul said in his final days at the end of 2 Timothy, his final epistle, he said, I'm already being poured out as a drink offering, and the time of my departure has come. Writing to Timothy, reflecting on his life, he says, I have fought the good fight, I have finished the race, I have kept the faith. And then he says, henceforth there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge, will award to me on that day, and not only to me, but also to all who have loved his appearing. So the righteousness comes not, not just to, to Paul, he says, but it comes to everybody. If you've loved for, if you've longed for, if you've loved, if you've yearned for his appearing, it's a sign of a disciple of Christ. One who longs for Christ to return on that final day. And my hope and desires for all of us, we walk through Revelation, that, that God would stir within all of us a love and a heart for His appearing, that we would pray, come Lord Jesus. So let's begin this morning by just reading the first three verses. I'm going to use these verses somewhat as an introduction to the book. <clears throat> There'll be more introduction even next week, but I'll just use the, the passages out of these uh, the first section here in the book of Revelation, just to open up for you and to help explain, to give you some guardrails, if you will, some guidance of how we're going to approach this book. Here it is, Revelation chapter 1, verses 1 through 3. It says, The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him to show to his servants the thing which must soon take place. He made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who also bore witness to the word of God, and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear 
and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Now from verse 1, I get my first point here this morning, revelation, the revelation is from God. You can see it right there, it says, the revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. That is, the revelation comes from God and is given to Jesus. Now, if you look carefully here, these first three verses, you're going to see that the, the track to this revelation to get to us, it takes sort of a, a long path. You see that God, <coughs> see that God in verse 1 gives this revelation to Jesus, and then Jesus uses an angel to send it to John, and John then writes it for his servants in the first century, and then it finally comes to us. Verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave him. God gave this to Jesus. And it says in the middle of verse 1, that he, that is Jesus, made it known by sending his angel to his servant John, who bore witness to the word of God, to the testimony of Jesus, even to all that he saw. So there's the little the route that it has taken, but it's the revelation that God shows. And, and, and he gives this revelation, as it says in verse 1, to his servants, he shows his servants the things which must soon take place. This is really, if you will, a summary of all of what Revelation speaks about. It's showing his servants the things which must soon take place. It's about future things. It's about things that will take place soon. Now that little word soon is actually right here from the start one of the most difficult words, phrases to understand all of Revelation. How can it be soon when it's been 2,000 years since it's been written. It seems as if very little of Revelation has actually taken place. Now, to be sure, there, there's much in Revelation that has not taken place. The kingdom of this world has not yet become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. The final judgment has not been enacted. There are plenty of people still rebelling against the Lord. And Revelation speaks about this process of God suppressing and with dealing in finality with all the judgment of the world. But too often in our minds in America, we, right, we think of 21st America, right, waiting for all the things in Revelation to take place. We think like it's all future, all, all waiting to be, to be unfolded. That interpretation stretches the word soon a little bit, especially if this word was written for those in the first century. And there may be some things that haven't maybe come to full fruition but have become, begun taking place. God's judgment beginning to come upon those who don't believe. And, and that certainly does take place. God judges people now in this present age. And, and that judgment is, is beginning. It's certainly spiritual warfare against Satan himself is taking place. So maybe not in the full dimension of revelation. But it may be the beginning of the fulfillment of, of the Scriptures. That those in the first century, right, say fit, sent felt this word soon, he's soon coming, he's soon establishing some of his, his judgment. They can see and they can feel that, but it's ultimately waiting a, a final day. And God soon may be different in his mind than it soon is in ours. Second Peter, when speaking about the judgment, says that God's patient, and a day with the Lord is like a thousand years to us, so he may be just a couple days in waiting before he brings all these things to pass. And, and we'll, we'll wrestle with this word soon throughout the exposition of the book. But my point is here that the revelation originates with God the Father. Right, that's my point. The revelation is from God. And, and I think the key to the book of Revelation is found in this first word, the revelation. The revelation of Jesus Christ. The is not there in the Greek text. The first word is revelation. By the way, revelation is singular, not plural. I've heard lots of people call this the revelations. It's not revelations. It's one it's the revelation of Jesus Christ as Jesus is revealed. He reveals himself. Now, the Greek word translated here, revelation, do you know it? Who knows the, the word here, translated, revelation? Someone's got to know. Revelation. Apocalypse. Isn't that? Apocalypsis. That's the word here for revelation. Apo from Kalups is to cover, so it's a, it's, a, it's a taking a cover away is what revelation is. It, it's, a, it's, it's the rolling back 
of the curtain so that you can see the set of the play. That's what this is. This is the revelation. This is the revealing. This is the, the taking the curtain back. It's the unwrapping of the present on Christmas Day to reveal the gift. It's the climax of the story which, which finally reveals who did it. This is the revealing to, to make what is hidden become clear. Now, unfortunately, this isn't how people think of the book of Revelation. Rather, they think of the book of Revelation not as an apocalypsis, an apocalypse, but a calypsis, but a covering. Revelation stays veiled to many peoples, clouded with mystery, not able to be understood except by the experts. Now, I can see why this is the case. You think about the book of Revelation filled with lots of strange things, swords that come from people's mouths, creatures with six wings and eyes that are all around them, lions that look like lambs, eagles that are crying out with loud voices, locusts with human faces that sting like scorpions, pits that have no bottoms, scrolls that are eaten, trumpets that are blown that bring forth events in the world, dragons that fight with angels, serpents who pour out waters like rivers out of their mouths come to drown people, women with wings like eagles that let them flee, a beast with ten horns and seven heads, bowls that pour out the wrath of God, a horse riding down from heaven, a lake that burns with fire, a city, a huge city, a thousand miles, it's shaped like a cube, a thousand miles in every dimension. Now, these things are, are difficult to understand, right? Yes? Yes? They're strange, and I'm not denying that. I'm, I'm, not the, uh, I'm going to be the last one to tell you, right? I'm going to be the first one to tell you. I don't understand many of these things in this book, Okay? But that doesn't mean that we can't understand the book of, of Revelation. Certainly, there are things that are clouded in our minds. And there, when we get done with Revelation, there will still be some things that are clouded in your mind about the details, but you will know clearly what the message is. The message is, Jesus is victorious. He's coming to establish his kingdom. You bend the knee to him or you suffer his wrath. That's the message of Revelation right there. Told lots of different pictures, lots of different ways. Lots of different manifestations of that. We don't know all the details, but you need to get that. Is that Christ is coming to establish his world. You bow the knee to him and join his kingdom or resist him and be judged for your rebellion. We see that over and over again. And we're going to see that you're on one side or the other. You're either going to be on the lamb's side or you're going to be on Satan's side. Now, Satan has different ways. He's the, he's the beast. He's the harlot of Babylon. Lots of different sides. Of, of where, where that is. But there is the clarity with which revelation comes. Consider also, look at verse 1. The revelation of Jesus Christ which God gave him to show to his servants. Note what John didn't say. He didn't say God has revealed this to the prophecy experts or to those who are up on all the current political happenings in the Middle East. He didn't say that God has revealed these things to his Ph. students of New Testament theology. No. He's revealed these things to his servants. That is those who, who serve the Lord. That is those who trust in him. Those who walk in his way. That is to all of us in this room who are believing and trusting in the Lord Jesus Christ for our sins. He's revealed it to you. That's good news, right? Because I assume if he's revealing it to us, it's able to be understood by us. Now, sure, the book is difficult, but picture this. It's, it's, it's not difficult because it's hard to understand. I mean, we can, we can look at a, a bottomless pit and say, <laughs> that, that's kind of hard to understand, but it just means this, this deep, deep pit which seems to have no end. We can kind of understand that. We can embrace that. Like infinity, right? Infinity is difficult to understand, but Kind of we, we know what it's talking about, like something long, long ways out there. Like we can picture beasts, we can see them, we can see the pictures, just the, the meanings of the pictures which are difficult. Oftentimes people then try to take the, the pictures and turn them into puzzles. And so Revelation becomes this puzzle book. I'd encourage you to think of Revelation as a 
picture book to look at and wonder and marvel, but it has, it has some meaning as well. But realize that those pictures will speak to you, even in ways that even their exact understanding can't. And I think one of the outstanding characteristics, uh, whatever, different characteristics of Revelation is that it's, it's written in a literary genre we don't often use. By literary genre, I just mean style. So when we read the Old Testament law, like we understand that. We have laws in our land with consequences if you break the law. Rules of which you have to, we, like we understand that. So we can understand the first five books of the Bible, which are written that way. We understand poetry and the Psalms that use similes and metaphors. We understand that, even if we don't maybe plumb the depths of all the understanding of that. We appreciate the beauty of the Psalms and the wisdom literature. We understand narratives. They're just stories of events that take place in history. <clears throat> we understand prophecy a bit, though that becomes to get mysterious about predicting some things in the future. Right? Like in, in poetic form, we, like, we can understand that a little bit. We understand the epistles. Right? We, we understand the Romans, that it was just a letter that was written to the churches to direct them what they should do. But Revelation's not quite written in any of these. It's in a genre called apocalyptic. An apocalyptic genre uses pictures and images um, to create the, these images in our mind that then will, will teach us. Sometimes these are, are fanatical, not trying to be literal, but trying to, to give us this impression or this sense of this, this throne that just, whoa, bright, and, and we just like so great we can't even approach it with flashes of lightning coming from the throne. I don't know if they're really flashes of lightning coming from the throne, but it, it's like that, like God dwells in unapproachable light. And, and these pictures <clears throat> stir things in our minds. They're not intended to be literal. And that's, I think, where we come across difficulty because we, we take the Bible really literally. But we run into trouble when you have the very genre that is intended, don't take it literally. It, it means something else. Like, for instance, I'm just trying to find something just to help you with this literary genre. I think in many ways the book of Revelation is like political cartoons. I think that's a, it's a very good parallel. So, like, like, if we look at this cartoon, we got an elephant and a donkey, right, wrestling over, playing tug-of-war with this ribbon, right? When we see this, we understand, this is apocalyptic literature. We look at this, and we know a, a, an elephant and a donkey, they're representing Who? Republicans and the, the Democrats, right? We got the, the Dems and the GOP, the grand old party. And they're wrestling, right? And, and what do you think they're wrestling over? Well, we don't quite know, but they're always wrestling with each other, right? But we fill in a little bit more difficulty, and, and there's the, the elections, right? Here's a, a picture of a donkey and an elephant wrestling over this ribbon in front of uh, this domed building, well, what are they doing? They're wrestling over right, the Congress, who's going to be there, and the political agenda of the day. That's how Revelation works. Yes, there are candlesticks and horses and locusts and dragons and beasts, but those are pictures that stand for something else. They are not literal candlesticks. Right? They're, they're probably not literal horses. The locusts may not be literal. The dragons may not be literal. But they represent something else behind that. Sometimes the animals in Revelation are quite strange. Like, look at this picture. <coughs> Any of you read Dr. Doolittle? Yes. What's, what, what's, what's this image called? What is this? The animal. It's a push-me-pull-you. We're in, uh, actually, in, uh, in Dr. Doolittle, the, the one side eats and the other side talks. So that, you know, you can eat and talk at the same time without being impolite is really what it is. But here you see this, this donkey <coughs> pulling, like, either way. Now, we don't even think something like this exists. But knowing it's a political cartoon, what does it mean? A donkey is probably an idea of a Democrat and pulling in different ways. You put a few labels on this thing, and oh, it's clear. <coughs> you got the progressive pulling this way, and you got the moderates pulling this way. And so it's just division in the Democratic Party. That's what it's representing. And there's division in the Republican Party too, right? That's not unique at all, but this is, you could do the same thing with elephants, right? Pulling both ways an elephant. Or how about this picture? Here's a big puffer fish. 
about to swallow a guppy. What do you think that might mean? Well, all of a sudden, you look at it a little bit, and this is a guppy different than any guppy you've ever seen before, right? It's got a human face. Anyone recognize the face? <coughs> Looks a lot like our president, President Biden. See that face is. And so here's this little guppy about to be swallowed up by this big puffer fish. So you're like, what does this mean? It can mean a lot of things, right? In this cartoon, it meant inflation. It's just the, the difficulty that President Biden and his administration has because of inflation. I mean, this, Jimmy Carter could have been there as well. Like any time where there's any inflation like, like coming, so, but that puffer fish could have been other things. It could have been economic demands because of the continuing war in Ukraine, right? It could be that. It could be controversies with his son that seemingly never go away or some crisis border, or just whatever it is that's stirring in the administration of the day, Though even without the inflation, we still could see, okay, well, here's a picture, this big fish <coughs> struggling with this man, and you get an idea of what it is. That's what Revelation is. I ho hope that you, you see this. Here's another cartoon. We see a bear. <coughs> You've seen this at um, Yellowstone before. The bear's sitting there, and these salmon are going up like that, and, and uh, these bears eating the salmon. This one's strange. I don't know if this has ever happened in real life. And that's the idea. It's never happened in real life. But it's a picture that we can kind of see and understand. Now, just like donkeys and elephants represent Democrats and Republicans, bears depict a nation. What nation do bears depict? Russia, generally. So what might this be a picture? If I put some labels on here, what, what, what do you think? The bear is Russia. What do you think that fish is? Perhaps it's Ukraine. I'm just showing this. This, this Ukraine, right, that should have been eaten by the bear. Somehow this, this little country is stymieing Russia. That's what it means. Okay, one last one. Here's another bear. And this bear doesn't represent Russia, right? This bear represents what? California is who this bear represents. And just to help you know, like, just because one symbol means one thing in Revelation doesn't mean it means another thing every place. So you don't think you got it all figured out. Just because a bear, <coughs> it might be California. It might be Russia. But he's very thirsty, longing for a drive. Isn't that so typical of uh, California? Not today. With all the storms and all the snow, here is California today. The bear is just swimming in water. And, and yet, and he says, remember, we still have a drought. Don't water your lawn. That is so typical of California. Now, I, I belabor this point about political cartoons because I want to help give you insight into the meaning of Revelation. Now, none of these cartoons, we have any facet in our mind that says, oh, that's real, that's what it is. But we understand that there's some things behind that which can help us to understand really what's going on. And that's how apocalyptic literature works. So, so John puts forth the image the strange creature, the, the women with wings, the lake that's on fire. It's a symbolic way of something else happening beyond that. And oftentimes, we can, on a surface level, totally understand the picture. Maybe not. We don't have labels, right? We don't understand all the labels. And it's okay not to have all the labels. But that's right where the, the difficulty in interpretation comes, right? When we try to get the, the labels, but again, I remind you, right, it's, it, this book of Revelation was not written to 21st century prophecy experts. Or was it written to people who could only understand when present events 2,000 years later took place? It was written to his servants in the first century, and they could understand every bit as much as we can understand. Right? So I just encourage you, right, to, to think about that. But think about the political cartoons, okay? We know what donkeys and elephants and bears represent, and it's easy for us to understand those. But imagine someone 2,000 years from now, if we show these very same cartoons to them, how well do you think they will understand that? I think it'd be pretty hard, right? When America is no longer in existence, which I wouldn't be surprised, a couple thousand years of the Lord tarries, for sure, the way we're going, we're just like Rome, Decline and fall of the Roman Empire is happening to America. We may not be here. But 
2,000 years from now, right, you show this donkey pulling each way, or this donkey and the elephant fighting with each other, like, what does that mean? I would contend, and maybe that those in the first century could better understand this than even our experts in Middle East political turmoil today. And we get messed up when we look at current events trying to understand Revelation, right? And we take Revelation on one side and we take our newspaper on the other trying to, like, put it in there. I think we run trouble. I've known many people who've run trouble with that, making a lot of false assumptions, making a lot of false conclusions. Like, oh, it's all gearing up, right? The end of the world is coming. Do you realize that everybody who has ever predicted the end of the world has all been wrong? They've all been false prophets. And oftentimes, people who have predicted, oh, well, the kingdom from the north, oh, that's Russia because of this or that. Well, it was Russia in the Cold War, uh, Russia in the whatever 1990s, it wasn't there, it was someone else. Oh, now it's Russia again, right? Just back and forth. But people have been wrong for often, more often than they have been right. Is how tribulation started? Well, okay, where's your seven years, right? And I'm just saying, you're not going to find me making predictions about how the world is or where we are with current events today because you just wait long enough, I'm going to be wrong. Like every other predictor of things of what Revelation means in terms of current events. <coughs> That's not the design of Revelation. Revelation written for the first century people to help them and encourage them. And I think they understood far better than we do because we're trying to look to our papers. And they didn't need 2,000 years of history in order to get there. But, right, here's some good news though. What is it that makes Revelation understandable? What is it that made Revelation understandable to those in the first century? They had the Old Testament, and they were steeped in the Old Testament. In fact, it's interesting about Revelation. There's not a single quote of the Old Testament in Revelation. However, much of the imagery of Revelation comes right out of the Old Testament. In fact, it has been argued that there are more allusions to the Old Testament from the book of Revelation than any other book of the Bible. So even though there's not a chapter and verse quote, Illusions are, are pulling in from, from the Old Testament. So there's golden lampstands. Well, those are from the Old Testament. Zechariah, chapter 4. Or two olive trees. Oh, well, there's a, there's a, a reference, Zechariah. Or the beast. So there are references to that in Daniel. Or this throne room scene. Oh, there are references to that in Isaiah and Ezekiel. And I think that those of the first century were saturated the Bible perhaps even more than, than we are. That's all they had. That's the only literature they were taught. First century Jews, they knew the Bible well. They didn't have all the different books that, that we have today. And so I just say this. You want to understand the book of Revelation? Be a regular reader of the whole Bible consistently over and over again. You'll see images come up over and over that give you light into what Revelation is talking about. So you don't come to understand Revelation by reading the newspaper, discerning current events. You understand the meaning of Revelation by reading the Old Testament, understanding how it deals with the apocalyptic, how it sees some fulfillment, how it deals with prophecy, and realize that John is a plagiarist. He's just stealing everything that the Old Testament was talking about. Rather, God was revealing things in consistency with how he speaks in his Old Testament. Um, I have some audio of D.A. Carson when he's teaching a, a class a number of years ago in the book of Revelation, and <laughs> I can't remember where it was, I couldn't track it down, but I remember him talking about the importance of reading our Bible when it comes to understanding Revelation. He says, you want to understand Revelation? He said something to this effect, right? You understand Revelation? want to understand Revelation? Well, just read your Bible. Read the 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 Bible. That's how you come to understand Revelation. Now, it's not to say it's easy. There's much in Revelation that's clouded with mystery, but the key to Revelation is the Old Testament, not your newspaper. Which is good news for us. It's, it's accessible. This is the revelation that's from God. Okay, my second points and third points will be faster. But that's just one interpretive thing I just wanted to put on your mind, and we'll, we'll have more as they come along. But here, the second, second and I think is important, the revelation is about Jesus. If you look at the middle of verse 1, it says this, 
He made known His revelation, that is God, making it known by sending His angel to His servant John. This is John, and we'll learn about him next week when we get to verse 4. But it says, John, who bore witness to the Word of God and to the testimony of Jesus Christ, even to all that he saw. The who is John? In writing the Revelation, John bore witness to the Word of God. That is, he bore witness to everything he heard from the Lord. And he also bears witness to the testimony of Jesus Christ. And this John's witness in the book of Revelation is about Jesus. I feel like I, I have to mention this here because many times, right, when, when people teach through Revelation or talk about Revelation or think about Revelation, that all of a sudden they're interested in these timelines and current events and, and, and how everything's going to work itself out in the future. And in doing so, there can be so much focus on the timeline and history that Jesus is forgotten. You know what I'm talking about? People are, are just saying, hey, I, what, when is this going to happen? And how's that? How's it going to fit in? And they're always just interested in knowing how everything's going to fit in history, in, in future history, rather than Jesus. And they miss the main subject of the book. And Jesus is the main subject of the book. He makes an appearance in almost every single chapter of Revelation. We'll see him described in chapter 1 as clothed with a long robe, with his eyes a flame of fire, his voice like the roar of many waters, a face that shines like the sun in full strength. Just Jesus in his majesty. That's how the book starts. In chapters 2 and 3, if you have a red letter Bible, the whole chapters are by a red because it's the voice of Jesus speaking to seven different churches telling his perspective on those churches, his evaluation of them, and how they are. In chapter 5, Jesus is worshipped right alongside the God the Father, being identified as the Passover lamb that was slain for our sins, purchasing our redemption. He is set forth co-equal and co-worthy of our worship. Revelation 5.13, to him who sits on the throne and to the lamb, be blessing and honor and glory and might forever and ever. Jesus is worshipped on the throne, and that's the whole point of Revelation. He's coming to be on his throne, to come and rule and reign, and we see that. Chapter 6, we see the final wrath of Jesus being poured out. It's, it's called in Revelation chapter 6, verse 16, the wrath of the Lamb. Jesus pouring out his, his wrath, his judgment. In chapter 7, we see this great multitude coming out of the great tribulation, and they're washed white in the, in the blood of, of Jesus, and they're worshiping Him, and they say, salvation belongs to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. Salvation belongs to the Lamb who's purchased it for us. Chapter 8, we see Jesus opening up the, the final seal, bringing the final judgment with these trumpets that set forth the judgment of God. In Revelation chapter 11, we see Jesus receiving the kingdom. It's when the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. In chapter 12, there's the great drama of redemption that's told. With this woman in labor and giving birth to this child who Satan tries to kill, tries to get after, but he's caught up into heaven. He's kept, he's protected by the Lord. and says this child is the one who is to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. Psalm 2. Do you know that psalm, right? Psalm 2, it's a clear reference to Jesus. In chapter 13, we get a sight of a book of the Lamb who was slain. And, and there, there are names in that book. And whoever's names in that book does not worship the beast. We see Jesus, right, is the one who's got the names. He's sealing, he's protecting. In chapter 14, we see the Lamb as the one protecting 144,000 from death. When everyone else is not protected. Chapter 15, we see a, a song that's sung. It's a victory song. It's called the Song of the Lamb. In chapter 17, we see, the, we see ten horns from this beast, right? Somehow off this beast's head, whatever. He makes war with Jesus. And Jesus comes out victorious over this beast. Revelation 17, verse 10. The Lamb will conquer them, for He is the Lord of lords and the King of kings. And those with Him are called chosen and faithful. 
Chapter 19, we see the marriage supper of the Lamb, which the church is united together with Jesus forever. We also see Jesus, chapter 19, coming riding in on a white horse, coming to rule the nations with a rod of iron. Chapter 20, we see Christ reigning with his saints in his kingdom. Chapter 21, we see Jesus at the center of the city being called the temple and the light. The temple probably in the sense that he's the one where we get cleansed from sins, where we come to God. Jesus right in the center of that huge city. Chapter 22, we see the promises of Jesus that he is indeed coming soon. Revelation's all about Jesus. He's coming to rule and reign on this earth. He came the first time as the Lamb of God to redeem His people. Revelation 5, the scene is in heaven. They're saying, worthy are you to take the scroll and to open its seals, for you were slain, and you ransomed people for God from every tribe and language and people and nation. You've made them a kingdom and priests to our God, and they shall reign on the earth. There is Jesus pictured as the lamb who had come and he'd suffered and he died. He purchased our redemption. Now he's the one who's worthy. Yet Jesus also is pictured as the lion of Judah, the lamb the first time sacrificed for our sins, which is referenced all throughout Revelation. It's always called the lamb, right? Referring back when he was the lamb, he's the one who died for us. He's the lamb. Even the wrath of the lamb, the one who died for us is pouring out his wrath upon those who didn't believe because you're not believing in his sacrifice on the cross. The second time he comes, he's called the Lion of Judah, bringing judgment for all those who refuse to trust in him and follow after him. And so we just need a healthy warning this morning, and you will get it through and through. Studying the book of Revelation, we cannot be, we cannot be more interested in timelines and current events than we are in Jesus. To do so is to miss the meaning of the book of Revelation, all while trying to get the meaning Sounds a lot like the Pharisees who tried to get the measure of the law through their legalism and missing love. I think so likewise, if you go to timelines and miss Christ, you've missed the meaning. You've like totally missed it. It's all about Christ. So let's not miss the lamb because that's how our preoccupation might be about the lamb was going to come and reign and so that we might say, come Lord Jesus, establish your reign. Thirdly, not only is the revelation from God, now is the revelation about Jesus, but the revelation is for you. And this is what's really encouraging. Revelation chapter 1, verse 3. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy, and blessed are those who hear and who keep what is written in it, for the time is near. Blessed is the one who reads aloud the words of this prophecy. Who's that talking about? You're looking at the blessed one. It's probably talking about a public worship service with the one who reads. More importantly, however, this brings a blessing to you, to the hearers of Revelation. And most importantly, it it brings a blessing to you when you hear and when you submit to the message of Revelation. Verse 3, blessed are all those who hear and who keep what is written in it, right? So the blessing doesn't come in the hearing. The blessing comes in the obedience and following after the message of the book of Revelation. Then the question comes, well, what's written for us to obey in the book? Well, throughout the book, you're going to see two sides presented. This is characteristic of apocalyptic literature. It's black and white. There are two sides. You either are submitting to the Lamb, your child of God, obeying him, following him, or you're following after Satan, or the beast, or the prostitute. You're you're one or the other. Like it's a a, a line right down the middle in the book of Revelation, there's no difference. It is clear as a bell whether you're on one side or another. That's apocalyptic literature. Now, in in our life, right, there are people like, "Uh, is he a Christian? Maybe not. I don't know. Like for us, there's like this gray. You have people who say, yeah, I'm a follower of Christ, but yet They say, Lord, Lord, but they do not do what I do. And you're like, what is that? We have people that, you know, say they believe in Jesus, but their life totally denies it. Or people who love to go to church, they're hearers of the word, but they're not doers of the word. In Revelation, that's going to be made clear. And I hope it's made clear in your life, in the life of all of us at Rock Valley Bible Church, that we are of the Lamb. 
No, no questions about that, that we're the ones following Christ. Because that's where the blessing comes. If you're not keeping what's written in this book, this book is not a blessing to you. This book comes a blessing to you when you are obeying and following what's written in this book. So you say, again, okay, what's written in this book? Well, throughout the side, right, two sides presented. And one of the great themes of Revelation is the idea of overcoming. Just look at chapter 2. Every message to the church, Jesus always finishes his message, says a blessing, right, to those who overcome, to those who are victorious, to those who conquer. Revelation chapter 2, verse 7, to the church at Ephesus. He was near, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And to the one who conquers, I will grant to eat from the tree of life which is in the paradise of God. Right? The one who conquers. That's the one who is following in the ways in which God has set forth. Who hasn't left their first love, but goes back and follows after the first love of God. The first love of their hearts. Ephesus lost their first love. But the one who doesn't, who keeps the first love, that one should be conquered. Or to the church at Smyrna. We see this in chapter 2 and verse 11. This is the church that is called to be faithful unto death. When you're faithful unto death, I'll give you the crown of life. Chapter 2, verse 11. He who is near, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. And the one who conquers will not be hurt by the second death. Won't be thrown into the lake of fire. If you're faithful unto death. Right? That's, that's the sort of dichotomy this puts forth. Is it, is it, it's not just, yeah, I believe in Jesus. This is no, are you going to be faithful to the end and follow Christ? Not denying Him? Not loving your own life as dear to yourself, but following after Him? Well, good news. Or are you going to be those who compromise, who are cowardly, who lie? Well, your result is bad. Like, which side are you going to be on? Revelation is going to give us this clear divide. It's going to call us, we need to be on the side of a lamb to experience this blessing. And, and throughout... All of Revelation 2 and 3. To the one who conquers. To the one who conquers. To the one who conquers. The one who's not duped by the false teaching. Right? To the one who's not lukewarm. Right? To the one who just continues in faithfulness. Who denies the things of the world and do so until the end. Even to the end of their lives. Look, look over chapter 12 and verse 11. We read about these who have conquered him that has conquered Satan, has conquered this dragon, they've conquered him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony, for they love not their lives even to death. That's what it means, these first generation people. And we're going to see next week or the week after that, that the book of Revelation is written to a persecuted people. Not to a people at ease, a people who are persecuted and the message is, stay strong if you overcome You'll be with me forever. But if you don't continue on, you won't. If you love your life, you won't. But how do you, how do you conquer? How do you love not your life? It's through the blood of Christ. That's why Christ has got to be center in, in all this. You follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Look, look, look at chapter 14. Speaking about those who are blessed... It is these, this 144,000 who have been marked and sealed on their foreheads with the name of, of God and of the Lamb. Okay, that's just a symbol, just like these political symbols recognized, clearly put out as a, as a follower of Christ. He says in verse 4, it is these who have not defiled themselves for with women, for they are virgins. It's these who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. You follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Those are the ones who will be blessed by the Lord. Chapter 1, verse 3. These have been redeemed from mankind as the first fruits for God and the Lamb, and in their mouth there's no lie, and they are blameless. Chapter 14, and verse 12. Here's the call. This is what, you want to be blessed by revelation? Follow the Lord. Here's the call. Verse 12. It's a call for the endurance of the saints. Those who keep the commandments of God and their faith in Jesus. The endurance of the saints. The perseverance. That's where the blessing comes. Those who persevere. And those who obey, who submit to Christ throughout their whole lives. And here we see just another sighting of blessing. In fact, Revelation seven times speaks about a blessing upon believers. Chapter 1, 
in verse 3 is the first time, and here actually is the second time in chapter 14, verse 13. And I heard a voice from heaven saying, write this, blessed are the dead who die in the Lord from now on. Blessed indeed, says the Spirit, that they may rest from their labors, for their deeds follow them. There's a blessing because they followed the Lord, where, followed the Lamb wherever they go. They've endured, they've kept their faith firm until the end. And they're with Christ. Blessing, it's a huge thing, huge Huge in the book of Revelation. In fact, one of the most helpful commentaries that I've been using is uh, Nancy Guthrie's commentary on Revelation. She simply entitled it, Blessed, is the name of her commentary. She picks up on these seven statements of blessing. It's how the book begins. It's all throughout the book. Blessed are those, right, who are following after Lamb and following in His way. It's how the book ends. In fact, just, we, we, we'll end this morning for the sake of time. Just even look right at the end, Revelation chapter 22. We got the picture with the river of life and the, the tree of life. And Jesus says, I am coming soon. Verse 7, blessed is the one who keeps the words of the prophecy of this book. I, no. John begins and John ends. He begins with a blessing if you're obeying everything in this book. And he ends with a blessing. I'm coming soon. Blessed are you if you keep everything written in the prophecy of this book. Oftentimes, what he starts with, what he ends with, that's like the key thing. Revelation is for you, for your blessing. Just follow the Lamb. And as we see these judgments being poured out upon the sinful, rebellious, rejectors of God, we'll know the blessings because God's punishing. He's judging everyone. And I get to be in His presence. Not because of what I've done, right? It's, this is grace. This is not obedience earning your favor. This is obedient, God's favor. It's, it's, it's obedience reflecting your love for Christ and your longing for Him and your trust in His sacrifice and His transformation of you. Revelation 22, verse 14. Blessed are those who wash their robes, right? And we know in chapter 5 that washing the robes is dying it in blood of Jesus. So it's symbolic again. Blessed are those who've washed their robes, right? Being cleansed through the blood of Jesus so they may have the right to the tree of life and they may enter the city by the gates, right? You, you, you wash yourself and your robes in the, in the blood of Christ and you, you can have of the tree of life which Adam and Eve had access to. It takes us back to the garden. They forfeited that in their sin. But we can have access to that. Think about the blessing of that. We get to have the blessing of the tree that Adam and Eve forsook. Those are the ones inside. But outside are the dogs, the sorcerers, the sexually immoral, the murderers, the idolaters, and everyone who loves and practices falsehood. It's like inside the city, it is pure as can be. Because these are the ones who've kept the commandments. They've walked in the ways of God as opposed to those Immoral and murderers and idolaters and liars are outside. That's what it means to obey. It just means to submit to the, the Lord in all these things. So the big question right here this morning is, right, are, are you blessed? Is this for you? Are you on the side of the Lamb? It's the message of Revelation. Christ has purchased it. He will win. He will bring his saints to be with him, but those outside will be judged for their rebellion. You'll hear me say that over and over for this next year because that's the single message of Revelation. But it's for you. Revelation brings a blessing if you submit and trust in the Lord. Let's pray together. Father, as we begin this book, I pray that you would stir in our hearts, convict us if we are not those who follow the Lamb wherever He goes. Those who have decided that I'm going to follow Jesus no turning back no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though I need just to be part of a remnant, though I may be mocked and though I may be scorned, and though all types of pressures and temptations will come upon me, I'm with Christ. I'm with the Lamb. So Lord, I pray as we work our way through Revelation and navigate these tricky pictures and images, I, I pray that we would help to see what they represent, even if we don't even know exactly what the label is on them. 
A beast is bad. A lake of fire is bad. Locusts coming to torment is bad. But there's blessing in the arms of Christ. Blessings being written in his, names being written in his book. There's blessings in following after his way so that we can join the marriage supper of the Lamb someday. That we can join the four living creatures and the 24 elders and the myriads and myriads of angels who worship you before the throne. And I pray, God, you'd so stir in our hearts God, to cause us to, to delight in the ways of the Lamb that we might know the blessing that, that indeed Revelation would be a great blessing to us. We thank you for this marvelous book. Guide us, we teach, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.